What, what is this, Niles? This is, uh, that's the famous goth rock anthem, Bella Lugosi's Dead, as performed by Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails, Peter huh. Murphy from Bauhaus, who originally did the song, and the band TV on the radio. And Bowser from Sha Na Na, did you say? Bauhaus! Bauhaus. What, what is his name? Uh, from Sha Na Na? Pe- uh, Sha- Bowser? Bowser? That, no, that's, that's Super Mario Brothers. Oh. Huh. This is Bauhaus. Who's the guy from Sha Na Na? <laughs> Uh, I, believe it, I believe it was Bowser. Bowser. From yeah, I thought Nuff. I heard yeah. him in there. I thought I heard him in there. Uh, we're talking horror films with uh, Niles. The Niles film files are wide open. I've been paging through them. Um, here's what I'd like to address. You write in your lengthy horror film dissertation at nilesfilmfiles.blogspot.com. The, es- the Exorcist, which has never gotten the kind of critical evaluation it deserves, much like The Godfather, its legacy sealed by brief praises proclaiming its merit without anyone really closely doing analysis. Then you go on to talk about it. And I, I paused right there and highlighted that. I said, wait a minute. The Exorcist has never gotten critical evaluation? Not in the same sense that... Uh, and The uh, Godfather uh, hasn't? Really, I... I, I will Google a lot of you know these favorite films of mine, and it's really hard to find a really rich, intelligent analysis of those movies. Wow! And you uh, well forget Google. Where, where it's you, easier to... also you also subscribe to all these film magazines and yeah. you read all these books on film. That just floors me. Uh, I guess less so in the case of The Exorcist than The Godfather, but the idea the idea that movies of of this caliber could slip by with someone really doing a thorough job on it. Of course, I don't know that anybody really writes about these things like you do. I mean, let's look at what I have in front of I don't know. You wrote about horror films, and you sent it to me today, and I printed it out, and what do I have? Single space, 20 pages. Uh, I've talked about your famous 65 single space, 65-page uh, review of Public Enemies. So you, you go into in-depth the way... Um, very few people do, so I don't know where your standards are, but how could, how could they, why did they not do this with The Exorcist? Well, most of the, say, like the literature about The Exorcist or The Godfather, for example, the books about that really have to do with the legacy of the movies themselves. They don't really examine it scene by scene in, a, in an evaluative Does kind of way. Does anybody do that to any films? Yeah, there. Uh, I think he, other directors from that period, say Arthur Penn and Ro- Robert Altman. People did that uh, with their movies? Yeah, I think you could find good books on them that really honestly uh, um, kind of invest in the in the film. And Kubrick, all, there's a wonderful... Well, then I think what's going on uh, here... Wonderful books about Because Kubrick. I read today plenty of people lamenting, it's the same lament you hear with comedies, that Hollywood, uh, certainly the Academy Awards, the Oscars, they don't respect the horror genre. Yeah, it, well, because it's, well, A, it's a genre, like the Western, uh, and B, it, because it's about ghosts and goblins and uh, fairy tale elements, kid stuff, or um, stuff that a boy will show to a girl in order to get him to get her to nudge up to him, for example. But uh, there's always been a kind of condescending attitude towards horror movies, and yet other schools of thought look at those 70s horror films, for example, the zombie movies of George Romero, and they see something very, very deliberate, very interesting, very rich, or the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, same thing. Um, A political commentary. I mean, when we look at Night of the Living Dead, the fact that the last surviving uh, human uh, of the main characters is an African American, and that he's shot by the posse of good old boys who are exterminating the zombies at the end. Uh, that's very deliberate on Romero's part and reflected exactly what he was thinking. Wes Craven, when he was writing The Last House on the Left, uh, he said that he was really thinking of all of his emotions brought up by Vietnam and Watergate, basically, and he put that in, into that hey, movie. Let me throw this at you before sure. I forget. I'm driving home last night, and doggone it, the guy after me was doing the Niles files. Drove me nuts. When did they start doing that, Flash? Have they been doing it longer than we have? The, what? the guy who goes at midnight, Grayson, what's his name? Yeah. 
he, he he's he's doing a lot of movie shows right now. He didn't used to. And uh, last night he was doing horror. And I thought, well, he's doing the Niles Files that we're doing tomorrow night. But his guy was from Rotten Tomatoes. No, he does that every week. But has he been doing that since May? I oh, thought yeah. he. Oh, no, he's been doing it. He does it every Thursday. Well, then every I stole Thursday it from him. I stole I can't believe I stole the same day. But Niles is better. I think TV follows me on Thursdays. He talks about television more than Yeah, but yeah. no, Thursday for him is last night. Oh. Yeah, because yeah. he starts at midnight. But he... So this guy's on, and the guy does do a terrible job. It's more of a TMZ sort of approach. Yeah. Uh, but although you've been accused by Colin Covert of being a little too serious. Uh, let's see, where was I? So he's talking about... I, know, I wish I had Covert's hair. Uh, I wish I had his head on a platter. What? Sorry, Colin. That can uh, be arranged. Stop. The uh, <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street, is it called? Yes. Okay, I'm driving home. They're talking about that film. And the guy says, I don't want to you know, give out a spoiler here, but that last scene, whoa. And the other guy goes, not only the most terrifying movie, if you ask me, but the t- most terrifying last scene in all of film. Well, what am I going to do when I get home? I'm going to go to YouTube and put in l- last scene, Nightmare on Elm Street. So yeah. I watched it. What? That's, do you know what happens in the last scene? Um, I haven't seen Nightmare on Elm Street since I was 12. It's, well, uh, it's about for that age. And the last scene was about as lame as a movie made by a 12-year-old. I just don't know what he was talking about. I, that can't possibly be the scariest last scene in a film. You don't remember the last scene. Girl uh, gets in the... Uh, with all her friends, gets in the convertible and drives away. Mom's waving from the porch and then... Freddy Krueger sucks mom through the window of the door. It just was, I mean, it was a sunny day when it happened. It wasn't, how can anything be scary <laughs> on a sunny day in the suburbs? Um, so anyway, what's your favorite last scene in a horror film? Uh, I think the one that jumps off into my mind is the last scene in Rosemary's Baby, which I think sort of elevates that movie above being a horror film because it's so many other things. That last scene for me is so hilarious when Mia Farrow sees what's in the crib, her baby, Adrian. And you don't see the baby, but you see Mia Farrow's eyes react and Christoph Komita's music uh, shrieks. And she says, his eyes, what have you done with his eyes? And and uh, the head witch, uh, rather matter of fact, factly says, he has his father's eyes. And then all these other, these goofy comic faces um, are say, just in a circle saying, Hail Satan! Hail Satan! And the effect is more absurdist comedy than anything else. And the, the movie has sort of stepped outside the bounds of any kind of logic and into the realm of uh, Polanski's really absurd... Uh, landscape, which is, I think, only a Eastern European could execute so well. The theme of using children, when, when did that come about? The idea that the scariest creatures are evil children. That's a good question, because at around the same time as Rosemary's Baby, there's another movie called It's Alive, which is also about a baby uh, And then there's a, a baby slew of other, aren't Damien? And Damien, the, uh, I think the there Omen, are more. And... Of uh, course, Linda Blair in The yeah, Exorcist. Yeah, uh, and then they they and it is it is horrible to see a, a Children of the Corn. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, we'll take another break and be back. There's um. There's something that I was going to say and I couldn't think of it. And I thought a break would be good to help me think of it, or I could turn the lights off again and just make you do weird voices while I tried to think of it. How long have you been doing that voice? Uh, since I was three. You, are you known for it? I mean, no. do your friends and uh, ever ask you to do it? My mom uh, does Only a thing. in the physical act of love. But, my mom um, does a thing. I, I, I might as well bring this up now. Now I can't think of my questions. You know, she's a lovely, beautiful, 86-year-old saint. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, you know, there probably isn't a sweeter human being on the earth. Although Nixon, in this resignation speech, I believe, said the same thing. <laughs> my mother... <laughs> Uh, I suppose everyone would say this about their mother. My mother was a saint. Was a saint. Uh, and she would be unhappy right now and spanking me. Uh, so my mom transforms herself 
And she got this from her brother. Her brother did it. And I never saw her brother do it. I don't believe for a second he could be as evil as she. Because again, like the kid, it's the innocent person becoming evil that's so terrifying. My mom bends down and starts pulling her hair down over her face. And when she bends back up, she's not herself. She takes her tongue and puts it up in her upper lip. So it pushes that lip out. And then she has real deep set eyes and she does something with her eyelids, pulls them down or something, brings the hair down, her lips forced out with her tongue and she's stooped over like a monkey and she has her arms down kind of dragging and she starts chasing us, making no sounds. And she's been doing this since we were little kids till my, my sister almost broke her, by trying to get away, she almost broke her foot and that was kind of, it got a little too crazy. Uh, but none of us, not one of us believe for a second that that's our mother during this time. Not one of us. None of us say, it's mom, it's going to be okay. It's not. Until she stops doing it, it is, it is possession. Now, this is a, a woman who, you know, has never heard a fly. Mm -hmm. And when I watch that metamorphosis, I think, well, well... What is that? What's going on there? I that think I, it's the most terrifying thing I've ever seen in my life. To this day, it's the most terrifying thing. You hit something on the nail about, about what horror is, and that's what's certain, what's, what's uh, sentimental about our, our relationships, what's, what we know we can rely on, and that being flipped upside down, uh, and what was so familiar becomes completely alien. Right. And uh, so parents, which is why or Lynch children. loves playing with small town America, the places that we think we know. Yeah, it's the big city that's scary. Here's a safe place. This is Mayberry, and Lynch says, "Uh-uh, not going to give you that." No, there's safety. Frank Booth. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, exactly. You you nailed what I think a lot of great horror movies are about, and that's, uh, you know, those are the kinds of games that grandparents play with their grandkids, and. Uh, Freud would say that that would re kind of makes you in wonder, you know, because problems my, later on. Yeah, I was going to say it makes you wonder what's going on with kids when their parents really turn evil, when their parents really are evil, and all of a sudden, the one thing, the one area of safety, the one thing they could count on, the one thing that they could run to, vanishes. What? What psychologist? I suppose we could ask a psychologist, but what? What are the? the little mechanisms in the brain that kick in to allow them to somehow survive. That's just a frightening. I mean, my mom changed back into my mom, but if she didn't, if she stayed there like Jonathan Winters stayed one time in character for about six months accidentally, wow, would that be nuts. Is your mom done doing that yet, Tommy? Nope. Nope. We're hoping by Christmas. Are you still living at the home then? Yep, we have. we're with the foster family, and she's at... In St. Paul, you can see her. When the paper boy won't even deliver the paper, he leaves it on the street. It's time for dinner, Tommy. News Radio 830 WCCO.